4 plus 3. Let me show you. Let me tell you what the Lord's been showing me. In the spiritual sense, that's what we want. Time for different people to come up. And it's not explaining great truths. It's not let me show you on a classroom how things work. None of that should be present as we speak. What we invite family members to do, those who are committed to our church and have expressed explicitly a desire to submit to the leadership of this particular church family in God. We are such people to say, hey, look, ask God, does he want you to give something to the rest of the body? We are, none of us are perfect. None of us have figured it all out. But if we come with that humility and that with sincerity, we're to say, Lord, I just want to share with my other family members what God has given me. God will bless it. You don't have to worry about the prettiness of language. So we open up some time for that, and then there's a time of teaching after that, um, where the elders, one of the elders will teach. So, again, it is not to make the visitors feel excluded, but it is important for the visitors to listen and to take in how we, as our church family, operate. You're being invited to the dinner table where the local church family of NCCF meets. So take it in, listen, and ask yourself, is this a church family that I'd like to be a part of, be a part of this area? If you don't like it, no problem with that. Find a church family. Find a church where you can be like a family to them. Maybe they have a different format. Maybe they have better music, better pre-speaking, pre better people. Or for many reasons, people may choose something different. But find a family where you can develop roots in and establish yourself in and learn how to love other people with. Not just keep getting fed. Learn to love other people. Practice your own being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So that's what we try to do. I hope that the visitors will hear love being spoken by the members who get up and speak today. And whatever they say, not, hey, here's this truth, here's this truth. I hope they see love, a passionate love for God. I hope they see love as I play the songs, as Roger plays the sax. I hope they not see the talent. I hope they see love. That's my prayer. I hope that as you're singing to God, you're not singing to be on tune. You're singing with love. That's why PowerPoint's not working. All those things are fine, no problem. If it's done with love, all mistakes can be managed, no problem at all. I hope you'll see love today. So with that as a preface, um, who would like to share? Uh, members of this church who have been committed would like to share something. Okay. okay, so I've got Jeremy, I've got Wen Hai, I've got Linda, I've got Thomas, I've got George. So we'll get, go in that order. Start with Jeremy, then Wen Hai, then Linda, then Thomas, and then George. Yes? Anybody in the back? I'll go and find out what Jeremy Good morning, family. Good to see everyone this morning. Missed you last week. I had family, uh, my whole family came in from Texas, and so we were shuttling folks to the airport uh, last week. Uh, so I missed you all, but I'm glad to be back. I, uh, I had a chance to listen to the message which Brother Zach shared, and it was a real blessing to me because it was actually, it actually spoke to something that I had been thinking about, which I wanted to share. I had, um, I'm a part of a little uh, small group Bible study on campus. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we read First Peter, <clears throat> which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, has been for a long time. I, th I don't think I realized, actually, until Sandy told me it was. And I realized, oh, yeah, it is. That's years ago. He said, I think First Peter is one of your favorite books. And I said, I never thought about that. But I think it is. Are we good? Um, and so, anyway, so I had, um, reading through this book, um, one of the verses that stood out to me was uh, uh, First Peter 2.16 which says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. And I'd, I had talked a little bit at the Bible study about how I had really, I used to mistake this idea of freedom. When I thought about freedom, I kind of thought of the American kind of concept of freedom with like a bald eagle and the right to bear arms. That was kind of how I associated freedom. Um, but 
I found, especially in my early days, that that kind of freedom was usually just a covering for evil. It was usually just a way to justify uh, sin. And I'd say, oh, I'm free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And I'd just do whatever I wanted. And then this verse was really convicting to me because, um, I, and I've learned, we've, we've been freed in order to be slaves. We were unable to obey God. You know, uh, Romans 8 says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Are you afraid it's going to come out? Um, and so, and so I, had, um, I had been really encouraged by this verse that um, we're now free to be slaves to God. Um, but anyway, but one of the things uh, that stood out to me from what Brother Zach shared last week was about balance and this, that there are oftentimes two things that we have to balance in the Christian life. And imbalance is ugly, but balance is a beautiful thing. And I had been meditating, actually, in the context of this verse about use your freedom as bond slaves of God, about a paradox which I felt like I had observed in my study of our calling, which is the paradox between being sons and being slaves. And it seems like we're called to be sons and slaves. And it, I was having a hard time kind of reconciling that. Am I a son or am I a slave? And um, I know that Jesus, in, in um, John 15, he says pretty clearly, you can turn there, in John 15, 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And then in verse 15 says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. So it's clear that we're not, or Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves. And yet there's also lots of examples in the Bible where we're called slaves. And I was just looking over this last week. I see in, you know, we don't have to turn there, but in Romans, Philippians, Titus, Colossians, and Galatians, Paul refers to himself as a bondservant of Christ Jesus. In three of those books, that's the first thing he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Um, also, James starts off his letter by saying, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude starts his letter by saying, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Peter starts Second Peter by saying, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So I see there's this disconnect. Jesus says he doesn't call us slaves, and yet... All of these saints call themselves slaves and exhort us to act as on servants too. And so I was just, I, I was thinking, it's funny, I was thinking before I listened to this message that Brother Zach shared last week, I've been thinking about this. How do I kind of reconcile slave and son? And the answer I got from last week, even though Zach didn't speak to this directly, is basically both. The answer is both. Which is true? Am I a slave or am I a son? Yes. Basically. Um, and just like we heard last week, you know, uh, when, when um, a man came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And he, his emphasis was, was on the, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded, love the Lord your God. And the second is just like it. And Zach talked about how um, that there are two commandments very closely related. And we don't emphasize only one because there are two sides to a coin. No matter how thin, I like that phrase, no matter how thinly you slice it, there are two sides to a coin. And so um, that's helped me as I think about being a son versus being a slave. It's not either or, even though they can feel like opposites at times, but both. And one thing that I saw last week in several of the examples Brother Zach used is that part of balance when there are these two things is getting the order right. Um, that one thing often flows from the other. In the example of the greatest commandment, Brother Zach shared that our love for our fellow man flows from our love for God. And so the primary thing is love for God, but then immediately it overflows in love for our fellow man. And so as I thought about this seeming kind of paradox of sons and slaves, I thought sons feel God's love first. And um, I, had re I had read a a verse in Jeremiah 32, which really spoke to God's love that I wanted to share. It's uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 41. It says, I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. And I just thought, wow, I, I really need to grow in my knowledge of God's loving me with all his heart and with all his soul. You know, we heard, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. But I love seeing this example in Jeremiah that God shows us way back that he gives, he's actually the first one to love with all his heart and with all his soul. Um, and then slaves, 
the thing, so sons know God's love. Slaves never do their own will. They always do the will of their master. And these things actually aren't at odds. As I thought more about them, they aren't mutually exclusive. Um, and they actually are reinforcing. And so I've noticed um, with Evie, my daughter, I have a two-year-old, um, and many times I've seen, when I ask her to do something, a lot of times when she refuses to obey, it's because she has no understanding of my love for her. She doesn't understand that I have her best interest at heart. She often sees my commandments as a direct opposition to her will, which sometimes they feel like they are, but it's hard for her. So for example, yesterday, she really wanted to put this snack wrapper in her mouth. It's like this little wrapper. 99 times out of 100, that's totally fine. It's just a wrapper. I don't really care. This one time, one out of 100, a duck had been eating it. And when she wants to put it in her mouth, I say, no, 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 you can't put that in your mouth. And she kind of, she gets upset, but she doesn't see that I know something that she doesn't know. She doesn't see that I'm... I have her best interest at heart, and even something that maybe she ordinarily can do, I'm asking her not to do, because I know something more than she does. And I see that with God, that the son, a son, is willing to subject himself as a servant when he knows the amazing love that his father has for him. That when I know my father's love, I'm willing to subject myself just as a servant, because I trust that he, he knows more than I do, and he cares about me even more than I care about me. And um, there's a verse in Habakkuk, um, at the end of Habakkuk. Let's have a race to Habakkuk. I'm going to lose. <laughs> um, but at the end of Habakkuk, <clears throat> there's this, I think probably the most well-known part of this book, is in 3.17. It says... Though the fig tree should not blossom, and though there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Basically, everything stinks. Um, yet, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he has, makes me walk on my high places." And this made me think, why can I trust? Where does this attitude come from? It comes from knowing my dad. Everything can be going poorly, but if I, tr if I truly know my father's love, then I don't have to be affected by any other circumstance. And so, anyway, as I, as I thought about this over the last week, this son and slave kind of dichotomy, a couple of things stood out to me as, as kind of takeaways from my life. One is <clears throat> to fight the urge of my flesh to seek for the right answer, the definitive right answer, um, but instead to seek for God's will. To my human brain, only one of apparently contradictory statements can be right. If Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, then there must be something wrong with people who call themselves slaves. Um, but God's ways are higher than our ways. So the question is, what do I do when I see an apparent contradiction? Do I insist on resolving it? And that's still my tendency so much of the time is I want to resolve it. But I've been convicted to embrace a mystery and to grow in faith to accept both rather than try to need to resolve it to find the right answer. And God put it to me this week, do, do mysteries diminish who I am to you or do they increase who I am to you? And may when you encounter something that seems contradictory, does it make you question this book, or does it make you stand in awe that my ways are higher than your ways? And if you can't understand it, maybe it's a fault with you. And so that was a big thing for me. And then the second thing uh, was another comment from last week. Brother Zach, one thing he said was, judge yourself to see where you lack. Anytime you see these two truths that have to be held in balance, judge yourself to see where you lack and which side is weaker. And for me, it meant... I think really focusing on the correct order and priority that my serving, um, my servanthood and bond servanthood must flow from being a son, must flow from being loved. That love has to be the, service has to be the overflow of the love that God has poured into my heart. But I have to get the order right. I can't start with service. I have to start with God's love. And um, there's another verse in First Peter which talks about that, or which I hadn't seen that talks about it, but thinking about that this week, I've seen it. It says in 1 Peter 1, and <clears throat> verse 17, If you address his father, 
So if you know God as your loving Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, if this is who you know as God, then conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. So who should conduct themselves in fear? Those who know God as their Father. Why? Because you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you were purchased with precious blood, precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And um, what I take from this is that those of us who truly call God our Father must especially be reverent and obedient because of the goodness he's shown us and because of the preciousness of the blood that he shed to redeem us. I came across a verse in Jeremiah which said um, a remarkably similar thing, which I hadn't seen before in Jeremiah 33 and verse 9 What's the source of the fear of God? You know, if you, if you call his father, the one who impartially judges each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. Um, Jeremiah 33, 9, it says, It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of the good that I am to do for them, being Israel. And they will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I will make for it. I never thought about fear of God flowing from the goodness that he's shown to us. That when we see in the light of our sin and when we see in the light of our spiritual death the precious, imperishable price that he paid for us, it would produce fear and reverence and trembling. They will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I will make for it. So just as we heard last week in regard to the two, uh, the two great commands, um, the love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The test of my love for God is my love for my fellow believers, just like we heard that last week. For me this week, I have seen that the test of my sonship, being a son, is my willingness to obey and submit myself to my Father's will and subject myself as a bondservant in complete trust. They aren't opposites, but rather the one makes the other truly possible. Hey guys, good morning. So I was uh, I was listening to a sermon by uh, Phil Lapp, who is one of the elders in RLCF, the church in, in Colorado, and I learned a little something uh, this week about how it's possible to do spiritual things and still yet completely miss God in the process. So what exactly do I mean? So by spiritual things, you could say like reading the Bible um, or, or praying, but yet I realized that it's possible to do those things and yet still miss God. And so one thing I do is I, I try to maybe set a little bit of time every single day to, to pray, for example. Let's say 10 minutes a day. I have a stopwatch. Uh, so I set it for 10 minutes. And it helps me because I have a pretty busy day, and it's, it helps me to have a little bit of discipline um, in, in my life. But I've noticed that when sometimes when I pray, maybe my mind is really busy or it's been kind of a rough day, and I just get through to 10 minutes, I kind of mumble some things, and at the end of the 10 minutes, I'm happy. I'm like, oh, great, God must be happy with me. I, I spent 10 minutes in prayer, and that's it. You know, move on to the, the next part of my life. But yet, that, those 10 minutes of prayer, I completely miss God in the sense that I never really sought Him. Um, I didn't really seek to listen to Him in, in those times. And so that's just something I realized, not to be simply satisfied with the discipline of having prayed or having read the Bible for today, but the more the question of, did I learn something from God? Did I seek to know Him a bit more through the process? And there's one verse in, in John that, um, when Jesus was talking to Pharisees, that I felt kind of captured how I was feeling. And this is John chapter 5, verse 39. And it's this, is that, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So through prayer, through uh, Bible study, there is life in that. But that verse, when he, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, talks about how you can still do those things and still miss God all, all together in the process. So that's just something, I, so that's something I, um, I, I learned this week, and I just hope that going forward, whenever we pray or whenever I uh, read the Bible, that it's... it's First of all, done with a good heart of really wanting to know God and not just simply be happy with having checked off the, the you know, my checklist that, oh, I've, I've prayed today or, or whatnot, and therefore God must be happy. So that's all. Hello. 
fam <coughs> hello family um, I've kind of said this before but the Lord is just showing me more and more um, about it uh, I've been coming to uh, New Covenant Christian Fellowship for almost one year it'll be a year in um, next month and <clears throat> prior to that the only spiritual family I had were three sisters in the Lord we are covenant sisters and we are bound together for life and into eternity and we know everything about each other and we love each other and we support each other we watch each other's backs and until I came here they were the only ones that I felt that that love from and I just wanted to share again what God has shown me in regards to this fellowship so um, you could turn to uh, John 13 34 and 35 <clears throat> Actually, Brother Zach has talked about this, and um, others have shared about our love for one another. Uh, John 34 and 35, um, in chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then... Romans 12, uh, verse 9 through 15. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Um, Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And then in um, verse 8 in the next chapter 13, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And in being part of this fellowship and getting to know all of you, this is what I have felt from everyone here, is that love for one another. That um, When I look at you, I see God's love. And that is such a blessing to know that, that what I've experienced with my covenant sisters, I have experienced here. Because that's what God calls us to do. And I just want to know, want you to know how much I appreciate every single one of you. And also to encourage those of you who come and share up here that some, sometimes it's really hard to look at everyone, but just to take that chance, and even if it's just for a moment, you will also see the love and, and the caring that I see when I look at you. And I just thank God, and I, I just am really humbled by his love from all of you. Praise the Lord. Every day, I experience the great love of our Heavenly Father in my life and in my family life. For almost two or three weeks, the whole family was sick. But our good Lord uh, healed all of us because His Word says, Exodus 15.26, uh, 15, I am the Lord who heals you. So, I 
strongly believe that the Lord healed all of us and we are all back to our normal life. We thank God for that. <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was born and raised in the Roman Catholic faith and I was in that. I was doing all the practices of the Roman Catholic Church for maybe until my uh, late 40s or so. But God opened my eyes. Uh, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We read in John 8.32. So, until that, um, I did not know the biblical truth. I was ignorant of the truth of the gospel and that is why I, I thought when I was in the Roman Catholic faith, I thought that I, I, I am in the right place. I am in the right place. I, I thought like that, but um, by God's mercy, my eyes were opened to the uh, truth of the gospel and uh, I am here. Uh, that is uh, what I want to tell you. I am here in this church um, to learn more about the you know, scriptures and uh, God is revealing more and more uh, truths from the scripture and uh, I praise God for uh, having a nice church family uh, to worship together, to exalt his name together, to praise him together. So I thank God for his mercy and his uh, compassion and his grace uh, showed on me. Um, Actually, the, the one song we sang last Sunday, uh, it captured me. It um, um, says like this, The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is you love me. So that is the greatest thing we can have in our life that Jesus Christ loves us and we get the opportunity to serve him and to know him and to love him. God's purpose is that we may see the glory of God in Christ but Satan blinds the eyes of the people so that they may not see it. Jesus laid hold of me and you with a purpose and I have to get hold of that and we have to get hold of that as we read in Philippians 3.12 Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So that is God's purpose that we have to take hold of this truth. Jesus, 100% God and 100% man, we know that. While he was on this earth, he lived um, fully as a man and he did not sin. He did not sin. The same Holy Spirit, that is the assurance for us, the same Holy Spirit dwelt in Jesus is living in us. So, we also can overcome sin with the help of the Holy Spirit if we fully rely on to the um, help of the Holy Spirit. Faith is to believe that God, that is, uh, this is uh, actually, this uh, encouraged me very much. Uh, I uh, see the right definition of the faith. What is faith? Uh, I, the, we heard um, from Brother Saik, God is more eager to give what he has promised than I am eager to receive. So that uh, actually lifted up my faith. Uh, God is more eager to give me uh, what, uh, more eager to give me my desires than I am eager to um, get or receive my desires. So God is more eager. So um, um, God is always eager to give our desires 
So he is always eager to give his Holy Spirit if we ask him, if we pray to him and he will fill us with his Holy Spirit and also uh, uh, this uh, we no work of just no work for justification but plenty of work for sanctification so about work uh, he said no work but plenty of work how no work to be justified but plenty of work for our sanctification so scripture is so perfectly balanced we heard from uh, elder uh, Jamie about that the, the the beauty of the balance of the scriptures scripture is so perfectly balanced. Actually, I hear this, uh, I heard this uh, uh, from, only from Brother Saik, I would, uh, I tell you, I heard this, this thought, scripture is so perfectly balanced. So we are all parts of the body of Jesus Christ and we all have something to do. All the parts of the body of Jesus Christ, all the members of the church have something to do for the church, something to do for the Lord Jesus Christ to build up the church. Thank you. May God bless us. <coughs> Morning. <coughs> Sorry. I have been <coughs> reading Acts of the Apostles uh, these days and when I was going through it, uh, there, there was a kind of a prayer and a cry coming out from my heart, asking the Lord, Lord, uh, bring these days back. I mean, you know, there, there's often a phrase that says we want to go back to the first century church. I mean, I, that's not exactly what I'm saying, but uh, I, I found that these people, you know, this, uh, this apostles, before they became apostles, they were disciples, and then when Jesus was crucified, they were terrified. I mean, to the extent that we may not even believe, and and they were all locked up in that home, of what we call the upper room, where they where Jesus had the last supper with them, and they were so terrified, they were locked up inside, and then wondering what to do, and that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and <clears throat> they they were. They, they received the Holy Spirit's baptism or I know ending and and they were very different after that they were not the same at all and and Peter could Peter who denied the Lord three times could stand before this multitude and say you are the one who crucified and he could point his finger at them and I mean you know somebody can say you are the one who betrayed two days back I mean 40 days back and now you say you accuse us of being being crucifiers of him, but uh, but that was the that was the work of transformation God had accomplished through the Holy Spirit, and 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 far from it, He was not perfect. He was still He was still growing, and He was still He was still learning, and uh, and 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 through those people, God did a work that Scripture says that that turned the world upside that turned the world upside down, and. And I, I was I was praying, Lord. I mean, even NCCF is a is a baby church, you know, from that point of view, from the, from the time scale that we are talking about. Lord, bring that same spirit into our midst. Bring that same. You know, what did they have? Basically, they had just their fear. They didn't have any qualification. They had nothing, and all they had was the Holy Spirit came, and and anointed them and, and put them in that one spirit and with one goal. And what I see from, from uh, after Acts chapter 2 is that there's a word which says they did not consider anything of their own. And they had everything in common. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm just saying it. I don't, I don't precisely know where it is, but you might, have, you might remember reading that. They had everything in common and, and they had one purpose. Yeah. Jesus has given us a mission and we need to go on accomplishing it. And, and because of that, these ordinary people, they had extraordinary power from God to do miracles and, and to give a word, not great big sermons, but give, give very, very correct word that is fit for the season. I mean, and, and that would lift people up and that would transform lives and bring many, many who are seeking to Christ. And, and, 
And one specific example, for example, when Cornelius was praying, you know, for Cornelius, I think it's in Acts chapter 10, he was praying and then, I mean, in, in the beginning of Acts 10, then God sends an angel to him and says, go and call Peter. And Peter is in, in, in some other street. He said, go, uh, yeah, devote in Acts chapter 10, 5. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He's staying with a certain tanner named Simon, who, whose house is by the sea. And then, and then, uh, then God did something in Peter's heart during this, during the, at the same time and made, made sure that he would go against all his reservations and prejudices against Gentiles. He made sure that Peter knows that this is from me and he must go. And then finally when Peter came uh, to Cornelius house in Acts chapter 10 verse uh, yeah, Acts chapter 10 verse 32 he said, uh, Cornelius saying, I, I was told to uh, send to Joppa to invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon, the tanner by the sea. And so I sent to you immediately, verse 33, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Very simple. I mean, there, I'm not trying to say something great is hidden here, but, 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 See this man's attitude. I mean, he says, "God asked me to send to you, and we believe God has a message that that you are you have come here to give." And my my point is that he had that faith. I mean, and and God recognizes faith, and he found a man, and whom God trusted that Simon will come and give him the word, and he granted Cornelius the faith to believe in the stranger that he is the man of God. I mean, who accomplishes all this? Is it because Simon is Simon Peter is the famous preacher in the town? No. I mean, he has been, been there for, I mean, that while enough for people to have recognized him as a great leader. But it, it is all God. It, it is all God working in the hearts of people because he sees a hunger and thirst in the hearts of people. And he sends people. He doesn't, he, I mean, he could have just used his angel in chapter 10. When the angel could go to Cornelius and say, yeah, you have been so earnestly seeking after me, so here is a gospel. Receive it and be saved. And no, he needed a man. He needed a man who has gone through the experience of the gospel to go and tell him, this is how you must be saved. And, and that was the witness and testimony God wanted. He didn't want an angel to go and give him the gospel. And, and Basically, I'm asking, I mean, myself primarily, and uh, to the extent that it applies to you, I mean, does God find us in this position where we are seeking after him, at the same time we are available to him, that God can trust us? I, I'm, I'm, I do not say this, let me say it very clear, I do not say this to uh, put it as a word of condemnation or demand or, or kind of, expectation on anyone. I mean, it is just that, you know, because these people, Simon and his companions and those, all those people who came to the Lord, you know, when, when they heard the gospel and when they received the Holy Spirit, I mean, they, they, they basically, as Sandeep said in the very beginning, you know, when he was opening the meeting, yeah, they, were, they gave themselves out to the Lord. They didn't have any other uh, private ambitions. I mean, they had their work. I mean, Paul was, Paul was still working and earning his living. I mean, they had their work, and, but, but they had one thing for sure. This is my calling. My calling is to live for Jesus, live for God, and to build this church and be available to whatever he wants me to be available to. And I mean, today we, I mean, at least we profess to say the same thing. I mean, at least I profess to say the same thing. And I was asking myself, Lord, is, it, is that where you find me? And I, I should say I find myself failing in that. I mean, with all the, I mean, we can, we can know the scriptures and we can know so many things. But, but God, I mean, for God to bear witness, I mean, then he has to see it in the heart. I mean, when, he, when beyond all the, all the layers of that onion, when he opens it, I mean, what does he see uppermost, you know, as the bubbling thing in our heart? I mean, is that, Lord, Lord, I want to be available to you. I want to be serving you. And I want to be just, even if nothing else works out in, in this life for me, I just want to be 
I just want my life to be spent in, in living for you and glorifying you. Is that what the Lord sees? Yeah, otherwise we can, we can have all the right, right words to speak and the right testimony to give and we, we can be even known as a great preacher unlike Peter. But God would not be able to say to someone, go and call George or go and call this person who will come and speak to you. God will not be able to bear that testimony. And, and is that, is, does, does that concern us? I mean, that's what I, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm trying to ask the Lord. And it, it concerns me that, I mean, I, I just, I don't, I don't want to have, be known as a man who knows the scriptures. No, that, that doesn't count for anything when we get up to the Lord in the eternity. It, it doesn't add, to, add, add us even one bit of uh, thing by which we can be awarded or honored. No, I mean, but it does make a, make a difference if we are known as people, you know, who, who's, who's, whose real passion is to live for God. And I, I say this out of, because I, I, this is my confession of hope that, and saying that this is where I want to go. And uh, I don't say this because I have attained to it, no. I mean, I say this because I see it here and I want that glory that the Lord should be able to uh, impart and work in, through the church. This is not done through one person, no. It is done through the church and, and we need one another and, and that, uh, that flame that the Lord has lit here in the church 2000 years ago and, and, and here he has inaugurated in this, in this new body, that should burn brighter. And, and that should be our burden and Lord, so uh, I don't need to look at others. Lord, how does it apply to me? And I just want to say in, in closing one verse from John 12. John 12, John 12, when, when uh, in verse 20, when some Greeks came to see Jesus, you know, he, he said, in verse 23, John 12, 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. And if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my, the Father will honor him. Yeah, they came to Jesus, I mean, and then he said, unless a grain of it falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. I would put it this way in my own words, to the, in the context of what I'm trying to share. You know, unless we are willing to give up our, our ambition. I mean, I'm not saying that we stop work and we give up work. And I mean, we do all that because we have to survive in this world that is getting more and more difficult and complicated and, and miserable. I mean, we need to survive there, and so God has given us something to earn our living and to and to go on. So we need all that. But beyond all that, if I am not, if I am not willing to give up my life, if I am holding on to that grain without letting it fall down and die, which means I am talking about the 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 things that are up in our hearts as ambitions that we may have. Uh, very, very normal to have in, when we live in this world, ambitions to advance in our work, in our career, in our, uh, I mean, whatever. I mean, we, we, we can bring in any situation by which, you know, we think we want to have that in our home or wherever, or we want to have that as a, as a thing in my life. So all that, if you are not willing to lay it down, then we, we will become, as people who are good Christians, good testimony, good knowledge of the scriptures, and speak very nice and behave very nice, but we will remain by ourselves alone. I will remain by myself alone and with all that, let me say it that way. But then if I'm willing to lose it, then I'll be able to bless others. God will find, I, I say this with, with the hope and, uh, and the confidence of the Lord, the Lord will be able to send me and send each one of us to those who are seeking for him. And he will be able to bear witness of us. And that is what is more precious. And that's what we should covet after. Amen. So I want to just...
follow on on what has been shared so far today. <clears throat> I think it's in line with what I wanted to share as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with um, the heart that I was. What I was burdened to speak on was a little bit about our church and some of the couple of things that are primary to our church. We call ourselves New Covenant Christian Fellowship. Most people don't even know, most Christians, most sincere Christians who've read most of the popular books in the Christian bookstore, if you were to ask them, explain the New Covenant, I don't think they'll be able to say it. I know I was a Christian for over a decade and I didn't know how to explain that. But Jesus said, this is the New Covenant in my blood. And it talks about a new agreement. Covenant is an agreement between God and man. It's like saying I'm working for a company, I've got no idea what I'm doing. I've no idea what the company does. I don't know what I signed up to do. I put on my clothes and I go to work. I've got no idea which room I'm supposed to go to. Did you read the agreement? Did you agree the agreement that you're going to go pick up boxes and move it? Or you're going to write this program? Did you read the agreement? And that is the way it is for most Christians. We are living under a season where God has an agreement between God and man. We have no idea what the agreement is. Read the Bible faithfully. We know the stories of David and Samson and Joshua and Peter and James. But we don't know the agreement. God has written an agreement and he signed it in the blood of Jesus. Sealed it with the Holy Spirit. And says, you want to live with me? You want to live with this new agreement? And so it's, it's a passion of our church for us to be able to embody it's no use to understand it in our heads, but to embody the new agreement, the new covenant. And it's, we're not going to go into the details. We've spent time talking about different components of it. But one of the key things that we've talked about often is that God is a father. And it's never something that we they get tired of speaking because we all fall short in interacting with God as a father. We have so much baggage from things we misunderstand about scripture or not knowing the agreement or by the way our own parents raised us that we have a very very distorted view of God either because of poor theology which we have to blame either our own rebelliousness our own lack of discipline to read God's scripture or we have to blame the shepherds not good teachers who are able to explain it properly but for whatever reason or maybe because of our own baggage that we're holding on to uh, for many different reasons, we may not have a good understanding of God. And what, one of the things we are passionate to pursue is to hold fast to the truth that God is a Father. That Jesus always called God Father. Except when He was on the cross and experiencing the punishment of sin, which we never will have to do if we are in Christ. So if we are in Christ, we never have to call God anything else but Father. It's a very, very important truth.